Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. This is very exciting. Um, we really appreciate your attendance and time today to discuss this topic. Uh, thank you also as well to, uh, to Emily and all the team at Informatech for a fantastic conference here, which we thoroughly enjoyed. Um, so uh, we're here to talk to you today about effective AI in stock exchange surveillance. Now, uh, when, I, when I was giving an overview of this topic to my nephew and his young friends the other day, I think they were devastatingly disappointed that this is not going to morph into AI kill bot technology. Um, so I'm hoping for a bit more of a, <laughs> a, a, a more, more sort of a marginally better response than that from this audience, because I think hopefully you'll agree this is a very interesting area for AI and machine learning applications. Um, so, uh, thank you. I'm going to start actually the presentation with people. Now, this is a this important, uh, important point, I think. This is a collaboration. This particular instance of AI that we have within Aquis Exchange is a collaboration between University of Derby Aquis and Innovate UK. Um, I'll talk a bit later about why this construct has been important to us, uh, especially within the, this, the framework of uh, regulation and ethics and standardization with bringing artificial intelligence into our company. Uh, but in terms of the support, the general academic support and, uh, and project support that this structure has given us, we give uh, real extra thanks to the people that have been involved. So I would mention uh, Dr. Farid, Richard Self, and Matt Hogan has, has joined us today in the audience for all the support they've given to this project um, and the, the way that it's developed. So let's talk a little bit about Aquis itself as a business. Uh, we had our 10-year party the other day. It was founded 10 years ago by our CEO, Alistair Haynes. I have actually worked uh, at that company for nine of those years. Uh, I actually, uh, I'll let Dr. Rizvi, our chief uh, AI researcher, introduce himself in a moment, but uh, uh, my academic background is, uh, is in physics and artificial intelligence. I actually started my career um, as uh, using neural networks to, to predict government bond market prices. For, uh, so back about 20 years ago in 2000. So I do have artificial intelligence exposure in the industry. I'm now um, the chief regulatory officer, which is, I suppose, a glorified compliance officer. So I work in, very much in the regulation and ethics area of the business. Um, but we've grown quite considerably over those 10 years. I'll give you a quick rundown of the, of the business, what it does. We're essentially a, a stock exchange trading venue operator but we build all of our technology in-house. All our technology is proprietary uh, and built in-house by, by ourselves. Um, we, we have a recognized uh, investment exchange in the UK, like the London Stock Exchange, which is a listings venue for companies to come and IPO uh, for, for, and grow their business and their, their capital opportunities. Um, as I say, we're heavily involved in the technology industry. We're developing a 24-7 uh, seven days a week, 24-7, 365 day m continuous market trading venue which will, which will never close, which we're hoping to innovate within the market. And of course, we, we have uh, all of the, all of the um, technology surrounding market observations and trading market surveillance to do that. So just to make the markets themselves, we're going to talk about multilateral trading facilities today. The specific instance of AI fits in a very specific area of our stock exchange offering. So these, these are multilateral trading facilities. So I'll give you a background roughly of what these are. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of the evolution of the stock markets, uh, most people recognize the open outcry floors that we've got demonstrated up here. There's still open outcry floors in the world. Uh, the LME in London still has an open outcry floor. So this is human traders coming together to give their buy and sell indications and trade with each other in person. This is how the markets used to be run, as I term it. In 1986 in London, there was a thing of the Big Bang where ele electronic trading was as introduced. Electronic trading in the, in the financial markets has evolved to a considerable degree. And the, the simplistic diagram that we have there on the right is really just to indicate that we are essentially network providers in this modern stock exchange world where we sit in the middle of a data center networking operation where we connect the most sophisticated financial institutions in the world to enable them to trade UK, EU and Swiss securities over these very low latency, high performance electronic platforms. So if you can imagine the open outcry floor morphs into an electronic marketplace, 
we end up in a situation where the indication, well, the orders of people that people want to put into the market, so their declarations for what they want to trade, the amount they want to trade, and the prices they want to trade at, turns into what's known as an order book. I'm not going to go through any of the significant detail of this presentation today, but just give the general gist. But what you end up with is a stack of uh, um, bids and offers, buy, buy and sell um, um, interests, with a spread in the middle, because when they meet and they match with the same price, they will trade. And, this, and these order books electronically uh, update uh, at very rapid speeds throughout the trading day. So to give you an example on the next slide, if somebody wanted to trade aggressively here, here's an example of how the order book would work. They would essentially come across a, sp a spread there, and they would be trading, you know, assuming they would be trading 400 stocks at the prices and taking out these price levels as, as they interact with each other. Now, the point I really want to show here, I mean, this, this results in transactions. This turns into a time series. We start to evolve this into a very data-orientated world, which is absolutely key to our business in the modern uh, trading venue uh, um, sort of exchange world. So this is a time series of trades. So as this order book interacts and trades with each other, it will produce transactions at certain prices. This is how stocks and shares are are priced, in the value of the companies fundamentally are determined in the public markets. So the weight of the supply and demand of that order book will determine where these, these transactions are priced, and that's what prices the stocks and shares. So, uh, you know, the, with the blue there being the buyers and the red there being the sells, by the way, but I'm not going to go too much into detail. The point I want to make is this is fast. The modern electronic markets are highly performant. We have um, Aquis Technologies, we sell all of our technology uh, out globally to to two exchange operators. Our matching engine round trip is 11 microseconds. Um, busy, really busy days can result in some 120 million messages a day, sometimes into the exchange. So these are all of the different messages that might be coming into cancelling and amending the prices where the institutions uh, want to transact. Um, so just go back, just, just for a second, please. So yes, we actually even have safeguards in place on our technology to throttle these messages. Um, because to 3,000 messages per second per port, we have many, many ports, because I suppose that the point I want to, to stress is this is algorithmically driven. This is high-frequency trading. Um, there's a number of things that can go wrong uh, or, or can happen as a result of algorithmic trading, which I'll explain very briefly now. Um, we call it light touch. So when you, when you had the very human interaction with the markets, now we're, we're high touch, so this is a human talking to a human on the telephone, I want to buy and sell, now we call it low touch. So it's machines talking to machines. Now when this happens in algorithmic trading, algos, of course, react to algos. And these things need to be controlled and monitored in a way where you don't have serious technological consequences that can radiate out into the wider economy. The one I would indicate there is a very famous one, you can look up, which is the flash crash from 2010 where some 9, 10% came off, off the Dow Jones total value in a matter of minutes and then recovered. In financial stability terms, this is very unsavory because the valuation and the stability of the global economies depends on integrity and trust and transparency in price. And these kind of um, anomalies, if you like, in the pricing rock the integrity of the financial markets in the, in the modern electronic age and all the safeguards around them. But actually, I don't want to talk about, I mean, there's a market abuse message very, very much wrapped into the flash crash, but it's market abuse we're talking about today. So when we have the Aquis uh, teams looking at the markets, what they're looking for, they're looking for, is it orderly? Is it working correctly? But secondly, they're looking for is anything happening on the order book that's actually manipulating the other algorithms to trade at prices that are favorable to them, that are not favorable to the other market? Are they basically tricking the other algorithms into making a profit without genuine buying and selling indications that they want to, want to trade? That's called market manipulation. So we now, uh, it, it existed on the open outcry floor, but it was pretty sternly self-regulated that if I was going to give a false indication that I wanted to trade something and actually wasn't going to honor that trade, it would be pretty much self-regulated across the floor that that was not, not optimal for the way the market was going. In an algorithmic world, you never see where, necessarily where these things are coming from. It's very, very quick. So in terms of spoofing 
and uh, smoking, all these other terms you might hear in terms of market abuse. Uh, these are algorithmic strategies that can be triggered um, in, over very quick timescales. Um, insider dealing is another one that, in terms of information flow that we watch very carefully. So let me just quickly lay out for you how this works. We have the most sophisticated banks, brokers, institutions trading on our platform. They tend to have different, um, uh, if you like, profiles, client-based or proprietary-based. I'm trading for my own money to make a profit or I'm trading on behalf of people that are giving me orders. These two general sets of uh, institutions exist and they put orders into a vast array of markets across the world. Um, we have different order books within Aquis and different markets within Aquis, so a different stock exchanges and different trading venues have many of these markets within them. Beyond that sits the Aquis surveillance team. Now, these are human beings that sit on machines and have uh, software tools available to them which can give them overviews of how the market is performing. Is it fair? Are all the members connected? You know, is the weight of the pricing going to fairly reflect the direction of travel and supply and demand? But also, is anybody doing anything in there which is nefarious or illegal? Um, mentioned that market manipulation is a, is a, criminal, is a criminal act uh, in, in the UK and Europe. So what do the surveillance team do? They pour over this massive sea of data to try and find areas where they will have a deeper dive investigation into whether there's anything uh, untoward going on in the financial markets with the way these algorithms interact. This will then uh, be produced into a report called a store, which is a suspicious transaction and order report. In the old days, it used to be transactions only. Now it's orders. It's a recognition that order manipulation can have a dramatic effect on the outcome of this stuff. We, we, we submit that report into the regulator. It goes into a deeply confidential pool of um, regulatory analysis. The regulator is the only, only central point here that sees all of these reports from the indiv individual venues. These things aren't generally shared for heavy legal confidentiality reasons. And then if the regulator decides that it's a prosecutable, prosecutable case, it will end up in the court. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is machine-based, it goes through humans, it's going to end up with a human situation where humans are going to argue to humans where they've evidenced the case from. They're going to argue what the evidence is and whether they can justify the case in the prosecution argument. And I think that's important in terms of understanding artificial intelligence, and we'll go more about that later, because this is a black box technique. And I want to emphasize, actually, it's very much developed as a tool to sit alongside the human beings. Human agency here is very important, which we'll, uh, we'll come around to. So that's the process. So what are they doing on these machines? What kind of software do they have? Now, I'll, just to caveat this, I'd love to have been able to give you loads of statistics on different types of alert types and stuff like that, but I probably would have been fired by my own compliance department. So we haven't done that. We've kept it very kind of light touch to give an idea of what's going on here. But here, for example, would be an insider dealing kind of example. So what the analysts would be looking at here, let me just very briefly explain it. We've got buys in blue, sells in red. The blobs at the top are actually orders, so they're sizes of orders. And of course, the analysts can delve into the numbers and get all of the problems, but this is just an overview. So this broadly indicates that the big blue dot there, someone's come along as a big buyer ahead of a large price increase. So one of the investigations around there might be, is it insider dealing? Might, might these people have acted before a big announcement? Is there a suspicion that they had information out there that caused them to put that buy order in there? That's not market manipulation. That's a different form of market abuse, but it's something we all, they all, the analysts have to look at. So they'll look at the volume. They will look at these alerts, which are all logic-based, and they'll receive all of these reports, and then they will have to decide what to investigate. So um, there's potential for thousands of these alerts. These logic indications that come in, they come in in high, high streams, uh, the analysts have to control them through parameterization, which is another area which is very, very open to, to uh, optimization techniques in the modern mathematical world. And the point I make is where it's a needle in a haystack job, a very small percentage of all of these alerts that are generated as indications for the surveillance analyst actually end up being referred to the regulator. It's, so it, it's really uh, a case of analyzing a sea of data you know, to pick out very small examples that, that, that finally make it through the process. Now, so there's the challenge. Now, at, at Aquis, as a technology-driven exchange services group, uh, we, we absolutely like to identify problems, 
and fit the correct technology to those problems rather than have technology and search for the problems the other way around. So this is one where, and I emphasize that AI is not Aquis's core, um, core industry uh, um, uh, expertise, which again loops into how we've set this project up, which I'll talk a bit later. But in identifying the problem then, if you have human sat and machines in this sea of data, this large amounts of alerts they're trying to, they're trying to go through every day causes them a lot of time and effort. Um, the, the, how they parameterize this stuff and the amount of information they receive through, again, is quite, can be quite touchy-feely. It needs to be optimized in a computer world so that they see the correct information. Um, strategies evolve over time, so they have to themselves even adapt the alerts themselves to make sure they're seeing the right things as the market itself evolves. Um, and uh, databasing all this stuff and providing some sort of standard framework for all of this stuff as well it is an issue when we're talking cross-venue or to regulators. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large data problem with, with, you know, with an AI background. You might look at this and say, well, how then can we hand that across to a data engineer with machine learning expertise to maybe address this kind of problem and then they might be able to help, help the surveillance analyst perform a better role Thank you, thank you. So I hand over to our, uh, our lead researcher, Dr. Rizvi, to introduce himself. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David, for explaining such a wonderful way. Uh, these are basically the rationale why we want to include machine learning onto the market manipulation detection part. Most of the points that he has already mentioned, they are quite clear. Uh, the large amount of alerts, parameter optimization related to every single security that we have listed on our venue. So there are thousands of securities, and they have a parameter set in place for those securities to comply within those parameters. Now, as markets evolve over time, and there is a trend that keeps on evolving on a second-to-second -second or an hourly basis as well, those parameters need to be changed or updated as well, because it's highly likely that they not all end up into any manipulative way, but it's just simply the market that is evolving. So those parameters op that op needs to be optimized, it's highly unlikely for any analyst to manipulate them or alter them manually in just one single day, because there are thousands listed here. Second is the market manipulation strategies that evolve over time. So as the strategies evolve over time, any detection model should evolve as well. That's another rationale. Finally, there is a need for any comprehensive database, an automated database that can be set in place. It's not just for use by, by any machine learning researcher working in corporate, but even in academics as well. If they want to use it later on, it will be labeled data set. If they want to train any model, you need using any supervised technique. It will be really helpful for them. So that's another rationale why we want to include this into here. Now, now that we've talked about the rationale, let's discuss the challenges, basically. So the challenge is, first and foremost, is the large and heterogeneous data sets. So let's talk about even our Aquis uh, uh, platform or Aquis Venue. We've got last 12 years' worth of data. And I'm 100% sure this will easily comply nearly 22 terabytes or 25 terabytes of data. So to study any model and to, uh, or to train any model based on all of that market behavior that happened over time, that is, and more importantly, because it's unlabeled as well. So that is another challenge. The second challenge is the limited number of <coughs> prosecuted cases that are available in the market, I should say in the public domain. Why we are talking about limited number of prosecution cases? Because these are the cases where, who end up in the court and then they end up in the public domain for the people being prosecuted. And these are specifically related to manipulative schemes. So the way they behaved in the past and we want to study, or any machine learning researcher would want to study that time series pattern in the way that end up finally being as or called as manipulative in nature. Of course, there is a definition, but has to study the use cases as well. Now, there are a very limited number available for specific, well, I should say, cases. Uh, so what we do, basically, we look for cases from FCA in UK. We look for AMF cases from France in Paris or we even go to ESMA in Europe, or if there is any scarcity, we even delve into some of the cases from SEC, basically, in, in the US. public domain. Yes. So another challenge is the high-frequency trades. 
and which is the high execution of bid and orders in nanoseconds of time, basically. So we were talking about mi milliseconds, microseconds earlier, but now it's in nanoseconds. And I'm 100% sure with the evolving of technology and possibly quantum coming in place, it may even go to picoseconds later on. So high frequency trades are very prone to market manipulation. So that's another challenge we want to deal. Second and the final one is the evolving of these strategies. So that's one of the bigger challenge. Now let's talk about the data analysis here. So here we'll discuss about the data source, the raw and orders, raw orders and trades, every single data that is related, related to orders and trades. That includes prices, volumes, uh, order cancellation, timing, time range, or order execution, order manufacturing, so many, so many things. The manipulative schemes, as I mentioned earlier, over here is an anonymized example for an insider trading example. So as you can see here uh, in the curve that points out the public news release, which raised the prices up, but the market manipulation detection model with that, uh, I don't know if I can point this out here or not, uh, were basically the event that happened here at the, at the very bottom. And I have put a diamond sign there. So a market manipulation detection model worked very well on this experimental data. And, uh, uh, but the process basically tells us about to study the manipulative schemes first, extract as many features as possible. It could be frequency domain, time domain, or independent using deep learning. But uh, this is uh, a, uh, an example using principal components as well. Uh, and then finally develop the machine learning model later on. If anybody wants to explain or want to understand about pr principal components, I can explain it later on. And finally, we develop a machine learning model on top of these. Either it is classical machine learning, deep learning, or even bio-inspired learning as well. Now, one of the examples that I've used so far, and this is public work as well, is, a, uh, is an analogy for pathogen detection. This analogy works very well into a human immune system. And an immune system, basically, a natural immune system, treats pathogens as an anomaly. And I'm translating or mimicking that onto the data computing side. So what happens, basically, uh, here is that in our human body, there is a dendritic cell that looks for the death of any natural cell. And if that death of the natural cell is, using, is by a normal process, it passes that information to the white blood cells. And uh, if it is an abnormal death, that is passed on again for the white blood cells to attack. So, but the process here is called something called as danger theory. Danger theory is exactly replicated in this model from a natural immune system onto the data computing side. If anybody wants to, again, I can direct you to the link where it is published. It's in IJCNN 19, 2019 work. Now, finally, I would like to dive into more specific details why this problem is not that straightforward as it seems so far. So again, there is an in-depth analysis where what you can see over here is a lobster database. It's an open source database just for the uh, representation uh, purposes here. So the, the red curve or the red spikes here, what you see here, these are the, the trades on an Amazon stock back in 2012. And this is open source data set, so this is in the public domain. Now the blue spikes here are the manipulative trades. Now, if I zoom out on one single portion here, and as you can see, there is an overlapping or resemblance between a blue, which is a manipulative traded pattern, and a red, which is a normally traded pattern. So why I'm saying it's an overlap is because they look similar to each other, and they are in close vicinity of each other as well. So any manipulation detection pattern, basically, leads to lots of false positives when such situations arrive. So our market manipulation detection model is very robust and has worked very well over here as well. Now, this is not a work done in isolation. So this has been carrying on since 2017. This is a part, most of the part of it was uh, my PhD project as well. And uh, these are the published work. Again, I can redirect to many of these. Over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so um, the, it, there's a title of the presentation, Effective AI in this space. It's, it, it's one thing to identify the problem. It's another thing to actually have a solution that works and produces results. It doesn't necessarily create the effective environment we need in, a, in the industry with which we work, which is 
highly regulated and needs to fit into a stakeholder acceptance. We're a public company and we clearly want to develop an, uh, our technology in a way where all stakeholders are considered. But I'll just make a comment here on the, the actual engineering build here. So again, under NDAs and stuff, uh, stuff like that, I'd like to give great graphical displays of front ends, but we won't. This sits alongside the human surveillance analyst. It's quite beta at the moment in terms of its indications that it's giving the analysts, but they are working alongside these tools, alongside their existing tools, to maintain absolutely their existing investigation process, as it's understood by the regulators, but we are building these tools alongside those analysts to pretty much verify the results that they are going to produce with the visualisation alongside that enables the human to interpret them. So I'll talk a bit about Aquas Technologies. I say technology is at the heart of our company. We're a trading venue operator, but all the tech is proprietary. So we sell matching engines, exchange as a service. Uh, we have cloud solutions, regulatory reporting, and we, we try and incorporate AI efficiency in this sea of data in which we find uh, our company uh, wherever, we, where we, wherever we can find it's effective. Um, so moving on. So what do we think about? Um, and we had a panel yesterday on the, at the Quantum Summit on regulating quantum computing and AI. And I was talking there about our company experience of how we brought artificial intelligence into Aquis a number of years ago and the process went around, around that. But I'll just make the point that um, you know, our regulation, as I'll come on to a little bit later, is quite principles-based. So it tends to be quite technology neutral to the point that it's up, it's up to the regulated firms that are em employing these technologies to analyze this for themselves and control the risks for themselves and, and, and have these proper process of consideration prior to implementation. Now, I actually think uh, amongst the debate there is merit in that approach. We're entering a world where there are highly nuanced adaptations for these technologies, be it AI or the subset of machine learning or quantum. So I do think the responsibility on the companies implementing their technologies is very, very important. Um, what do we consider before we implementing any technology, not just AI, it could, be, it could be any example. We would look at things like, is it going to work? How many people is it going to take to run this thing? Uh, is it, you know, what are the customer implications? What are the risk of this stuff? And with AI, the very important one as well, I think, is how do we verify this stuff is actually going to work? And, uh, and, and that comes into, I suppose, a company consideration that if you're going to onboard these technologies with, uh, with an expert, with a less expert that's going to feed, feed the information into the governance level, have you got the right construct in this company right through to to the board level and beyond to be able to explain this technology and justify it and make it accountable. So all of these things come into the decision before you even, uh, <coughs> even, even you know, begin to research these technologies, really. So it's part, it, a lot of these things are done in parallel. They're not, this isn't sequential. We would consider our regulatory considerations here. Now, we are, I say, heavily regulated. We, we're in the city of London, which is where we were founded and based. We also operate out of Paris. So we have uh, an AMF EU regulatory license and an FCA UK regulatory license. Uh, a lot of these regulations are homogenous. However, we have to watch for divergence between these and globally. However, I think the, the point to make here is that the principle really remain broadly, I think, the same on both sides still at this stage. The EU AI Act has just been very recently solidified, I believe. But it's, again, it's on a risk basis for people to assess themselves how they're putting these technologies out into society, the harm they might do, and the level of transparency and regulation that they themselves would feel they would need, need to cover this kind of stuff uh, confidently. It moves heavily into ethics, I think, which any company with a uh, responsible company would consider. What are we actually doing here? Can we explain it? And I'll, I'll move on to that tooling point again. If you remember, the process ends up ultimately in a court here with humans explaining it to humans. So this has to be a tool to help a human agent do their job properly. And I think that's a really big emphasis. This isn't a black box which is going to spew out results that are going to end up with prosecutions that are unjustifiable. That's not only unrealistic, it's morally undesirable. So it's controlled as a tool that is very much in the human agent's hands here to, to manipulate. So I think that's an important sort of uh, basis for the, all of the eth ethical considerations. But wh where does it get trained? Where does the data go? Is it confidential? Has it got privacy? Uh, is it fair? Is this thing going to produce a bias that we're not going to see at some stage? That, you know, so again, 
That loop around for the human being in control of the information they're seeing is important, and I'll emphasise that, that again. I, I can't see the time down there, Doctor, but how I do I think it's, it's a half. Okay, so to that message, and we were talking yesterday about regulatory frameworks, about how this stuff gets produced. It's very important here to have all of the stakeholders involved in how you push these technologies forward. This is how regulatory frameworks are constructed. Regulators don't necessarily have all the resources to keep on talking, nor, nor should they. This has to be an evolution with everybody involved, and this is very much how Acris Exchange PLC uh, adopts its technology. We have a, uh, you know, my, my chance to be a bit, uh, bit crawly here. We have a very supportive board, but we do. They are very engaged with new technologies, and they want to understand how these technologies work, so they want the right skill sets in the company to deliver this kind of information to them when they understand. We obviously have to fit into a very tight regulated environment. It has to work with the industry. We work with industry groups to set these standards to how we progress these technologies, even in our nuanced um, uh, applications and implementations. Um, academia. And this is actually when we went back to this specific instance of uh, machine learning and AI with this specific problem, and we analysed this. As I said at the start of the presentation, we do have AI expertise within the, within the firm. However, it's not our core technology. So in, in onboarding this technology to offer, how do we ensure all these stakeholders are included? And this is, again, where I give a, uh, 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 acknowledgement. Sorry, if you go back one, please. Acknowledgement to the, to, the, to the Knowledge Transfer Partnership. That is a government-run program which has helped us bring academia into our industry in a way that's provided an extra governance level with the academic governance level with uh, Dr. Farid, Richard Self, and Matt Hogan here as our, our KT, KTN advisor, KTP advisor, to provide that extra governance layer of the academics saying to us, how is this working? The verification of the actual, you know, the actual technology itself, which is a skill set we might not purely have within Acris Exchange. We can incorporate that through that extra governance, um, governance uh, loop in there, which is very important, and then loop that back into this entire message. And again, is it good for society? This is the last point. I know Dr. Yeah. rushing me on there. But clean markets are good for society. Integrity in the stock markets is extremely important to the economies of the world. This is the reason why helping a human surveillance analyst, which I'll come on to now, do their job more efficiently is ultimately what we're trying to do here. I'm going to move on to Mr. John Knight here, so I hope I don't embarrass him here. This is actually our human agent, our principal human agent. We have a large surveillance team. This is our head of surveillance. Now, uh, I don't know if I'm talking to the right age of audience, but this is John on the life floor, the, you know, the London International Financial Futures Exchange, and um, where he was a trader. His nickname was actually Doogie Hauser, so I don't know if anybody has hit the right age there. But this is his reality these days. He's, not a He's now a surveillance officer. He sits at machines dealing with information. So I'm just... The point I want to make here, the human agency is extremely important. I started with people at the start of the presentation. I will end with people. I was having this debate with our COO the other day, not a debate, discussion, but he was you know, quite correct in the conclusions that people are the reason we have a business in the first place, people operate the business, and really all of these technologies should be to serve us to do that better. And I think that's an important ethical message here. This is the human agent, so all of the loop of does this work, how does it work, how much of a time does it take, you know, resource, all of these considerations loop through the user. So that's a, I think that's an important message to get. So the future, yeah. I think these technologies are only going to grow. I can see the human agency capability with these technologies growing. I look at a future where they can spend their time actually investigating the cases, the really interesting cases that the regulators will want to see and will ultimately be scrutinised you know, at a high level. So uh, the important thing for us as a, as, a, as, a, as a technology company is to make sure we evolve these strategies in a way that the market accepts, the regulator accepts, and most importantly, our human agents there receive the benefit and improves their job quality, uh, lives and experience. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.